All right. Um, okay. So, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Matthew and uh, Joseph, uh, to be here with us this morning. I met last year, Joseph. So correct me if I if I my pronunciation is wrong. I know that he's like multilingual kind of uh, person, speaks in Spanish and English and many other languages. And we met uh, last year in, at EGOS in Cagliari conference. Uh, in, in a panel organized by some common friends, there were Bobby Banerjee and other people there. And uh, well, I discovered that so we shared something, some in, research interests in common. Uh, Joseph is doing a PhD in the University of London, and uh, his work uh, is focused on critical theory, organization study, and political eco ecology. And he was uh, presenting something at Digos on, on, on planning. And me and my friends Andrea Genovese has been uh, discussing about planning uh, since a uh, couple of years now and uh, in introducing debates about uh, democratic central planning in one of the H2020 projects that I coordinate, uh, just transition to circular economy. And uh, yes, and that's, I think that's, uh, is Joseph's work uh, is super interesting and he just published an article in a special edition on organization. And I invited him to, to share his idea with us. Uh, so without any further ado, I, I give you the room. Uh, I don't know if you have like, some slides or how do you, yeah. how, how yeah. you are going to organize the, the, the presentation with the, the co-author of, of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the abstract, which is Ma Matthew Thompson. And yeah, so the floor okay. is yours. Yeah, so I'm just going to share some slides. Um, uh, my my Teams is a bit slow right now. Matt, while I do that, um, would you like to maybe um, introduce yourself? Uh, yourself? Um, yeah, sure. Nice, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, I guess uh, Yusuf and I have been sort of collaborating on similar research interests for about two years now, maybe year and a half. Thinking about um, post-capitalist planning, economic democracy in 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 terms of urban planning and economic planning. My interests are kind of more in the urban side of things. So I'm at the Bartlett School of Planning at UCL. Um, literally just joined in January so I've just suddenly started teaching for the first time in about six or seven years so it's like whoa, whoa you know uh, lecture planning I'm in the le weekly lecture planning uh, mode um, so yeah I did my master's there back in the day a, a decade or so ago so I've sort of been trained as a spatial planner um, but yeah my interests are kind of in municipalism found the foundational economy uh, socio-ecological transition, these these kind of aspects. Yeah, and that's I guess that's how Yusuf and I um, started working together. Are you are you all set, Yusuf? Um, for some reason, I can't find the the share option. Um, not it, not at the top, not at the. Um... So I see. Sh I you see share, but it's not it's not showing me. Um, no, I don't think so. Any screens. Um, you want me to share my screen and you basically press slide when. Yeah, maybe we can do that. Can you can you share the no. screen, uh, Matt, and then. And you can just be like next. Yeah, yeah. Is that share? Is this sharing? Yes, I see our I see the Teams chat here. Yeah, yeah you can see the slides. No, uh, no. Happening. Not this, not the slides. Hi. Um, let's have a look. Let me try again. Wow, tech tech troubles after. Oh, it's Teams. <laughs> Teams is terrible. After all these years of working out how to use this stuff. Screen. That's if that's I share. Okay, this... I can see the. Oh, I can no. see the. Yeah. You can see the yeah, slides. Can... Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, there we go. We're on the first page, yeah? yeah. No, I don't. I don't see the um, I don't see the slides, Matt. Oh, God, what? Why is that? 
What's going on there? Okay, I see now. We see it, we're seeing the slides. Oh, maybe it was because I had the teams in front of it. Is that, can okay. you see the slides now? Yeah, now I can That's see right. Okay, Woo! perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Mario, for the for the introduction, um, and uh, thanks everyone for you know being here. And and uh, we're very pleased to to be presenting this work um, uh, to this group. Um, so uh, Matt, maybe you can um, move on to the next slide and just get straight into it. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to to begin with these uh, two quotes, um, which I think capture the spirit of of the work that um, we're engaging with and and that we're trying to do ourselves. Um, so th this is a quote from uh, Time, Labor, and Social Domination uh, by Moisha Postone, uh, where he says uh, the dream implied uh, by the capital form is one of utter boundlessness. Uh, a fantasy of freedom as the complete liberation from matter, from nature. This dream of capital is becoming the nightmare uh, of that which it strives to free itself from uh, the planet and its inhabitants. Um, Postone continues that uh, humanity might awaken from this uh, dreamlike state um, by resting control over this drive for boundless expansion from capital um, and allowing for a different mode of, of organization uh, in which people exercise a higher degree of, of control over their lives and and more consciously regulate kind of their relationship to to the rest of nature. Um, and, and I see that as kind of connected to this Jameson phrase, which I won't read, um, but which is an essentially an argument for a collective project uh, in which the majority of the population participates. Uh, and to put it briefly, Jameson associates this uh, with the notion of planning. Um, so yeah, if you can move, yeah. So with, with this in mind, um, Matt and I essentially, we, we argue that democratic planning is, is necessary for developing uh, the forms of collective intelligibility uh, and power needed for planetary justice. Um, so in the sense we are, we join uh, uh, this, this new literature on planning um, that is kind of uh, emerging. Um, and uh, we argue that kind of despite uh, limitations, uh, concrete examples of, of new municipalist praxis uh, can contribute to kind of reimagining and reframing um, economic planning today. Uh, so essentially, we, we see municipalist experiments uh, emerging periodically uh, throughout history um, as being of special interest um, to protecting and expanding uh, democratic, feminist, anti-racist, and sustainable uh, urban, rural, like metabolic regimes. Um, and, and here is kind of the work below that, you know, at the bottom of the slide that we've done together, uh, which is the basis of the seminar. Um, so the first article is the one that uh, Mario referred to, um, which is, um, it will, it's coming out sometime soon uh, in organization in the special issue on public value. Um, and um, the other one is an article that's already out in Competition and Change as part of a special issue on planning. Uh, and finally, um, a book chapter uh, which deals more with the question of the post-capitalist countryside, uh, where we also touch on, um, on, uh, on these questions. Um, so uh, just to give you kind of a, a little um, overview of how we're going to present this work today, um, Matt and I have essentially tried to synthesize this work, uh, drawing on these two publications, the two journal articles and, and the book chapter. Um, and yeah, this is more or less how we've planned the presentation. So I'll talk for another 10 to 15 minutes on this part one. Um, and then uh, Matt will will take over from there, um, dealing with these sort of more spatial questions of economic planning. All right. Um, okay, so so economic planning uh, seems to be back on the agenda. Um, it's called for by those who seek to transform, so to tame and and sort of uh, reform capitalism within a kind of social democratic horizon, perhaps using terms like green industrial policy, um, 
for example, um, but also by those who see it as kind of necessary to uh, as a necessary feature of a post capitalist transition and future. Um, and I think we we are much more on on the you know contributing to the second um, second aspect of this renewal of of planning thought and practice. Uh, before getting into this, um, what is economic planning? Um, there are these four kind of four dimensions which I think are are fundamental to economic planning, which I think are uh, might be helpful to go through. Uh, so first, economic planning is essentially ex ante organizing. Um, it is, in in other words, a purpose dependent and goal oriented form of organizing, uh, whatever that goal may be. Um, and it can be contrasted um, with the kind of ex post coordination that you see uh, with with market mediated uh, like mechanisms. Um, another key dimension is this aspect of revisability. So planning should allow for revisability um, while kind of subjective uncertainties may be reduced. Uh, objective uncertainties obviously remain. Um, and ideally, this would be a kind of democratic form of, of you know, revisability, uh, one that could also use, as I will talk uh, about later, um, cybernetic protocols uh, for you know, uh, dynamic coordination, uh, let's say. Uh, this third, the third aspect is this question of sovereignty. So planning is always grounded in the decision making authority of a political subject, uh, be that the nation, a commons or a corporation. Let's say. Um, and finally, uh, linked to this question of, of decision making or, or action, um, this presupposes questions of epistemology. Um, you know, what is the what is essentially the the economy subject of knowledge? Again, is it the state? Is it the people? Uh, is it the market? Um, um, Matt, if you could just stay on on that slide. Um, Sorry. And uh, yeah, so I thought also this this image kind of nicely uh, illustrates um, what economic planning might look like. Um, so unlike corporate planning, which a lot of economic planning thought borrows from, uh, in the case of economic planning, we have an entire community that is involved in planning um, at a kind of either local, regional, national or international scale. Um, and just to, to tell you about this image, this is from a series called uh, Cuadernos de Educación Popular, which is, I think, notebooks for popular uh, education. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it, I think these were made in Chile in the 70s. And Marta Harnecker, who's written on planning, was also involved in, in this in this series. Um, uh, but you can find all these on, on Marxist.org, and I think they're nice to go through. So, um, yeah, just wanted to point that out. OK, um, you can move on. Yeah. So uh, moving on, um, one of the most kind of influential critiques of planning is, of course, Hayek's, um, which is the focus of um, or which is what I focus on in the organization paper. Um, I wasn't sure how much time to spend on this. Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to I'm going to skip it for now and, and maybe come back to it uh, later if, if necessary. Um, I'll just say that um, you know what I was trying to 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 argue in that section in the paper is that uh, the politics kind of that follows from this Hayekian critique, uh, which is not the only critique but is a central one, uh, is one that radically limits uh, the scope and and quality of democratic will formation and decision making. Um, and it's, it presumes and reproduces uh, the exclusion of the vast majority of the world's population from uh, participating in, in shaping how our relationship uh, with nature is organized. Um, and this is, uh, so anyway, so on the top there's Hayek, which you probably recognize, and at the bottom is a picture of uh, Otto Neurath, which was another key figure in the early calculation debate. Um, and this is an excerpt from um, a short piece written in the 40s where he's re responding to Hayek. Um, I won't read the whole um, quote, uh, but essentially, you know, Nurat says, ultimately, the only real choice that Hayek leaves us is with this choice between uh, the freedom, the so-called freedom of market competition and the totalitarianism of planners. Um, and he asked this question, um, you know, he asked the question, is it so unlikely that some people having to choose between the totalitarianism 
uh, having to choose between totalitarianism with full employment to a free market with its usual bumps and slumps will choose the former, the tears in their eyes. Yeah, and, and Neurath suggests that you know there is there's an there's an alternative um, that planning is irreducible to this kind of reductive you know dichotomization that that Hayek that that is that informs Hayek's thought, um, and and points towards kind of a more cooperative uh, and pluralistic conception of planning, one in which democracy is understood, and this is uh, quoting from the passage, as the acknowledgement of non-conformism within a freely accepted social order. Um, and again, I think this also captures um, Matt's and, and my interest in, in, in this question of planning and how we might rethink it today. Um, OK, so again, yeah, Hayek and Neurath, uh, these were two main figures involved in the first planning debate of the 1920s. Um, and there are still major influences in the contemporary debate. Um, this periodization that is that I've sort of laid out here is based on uh, Robin Hanel's periodization um, in his recent book on economic planning. Uh, so in, in this very kind of brief overview of the history of planning, um, he he comes up with these three <coughs> three sort of uh, uh, planning debates or three generations of planning, let's say. So the first planning debate is the original planning debate uh, between Hayek, von Mises, Neurath, uh, Oscar Lang, and so on. Um, and the second planning debate is more or less uh, um, what comes out of the post-World War II period. Um, and here there are many international experiences to draw on. Uh, so not just the Soviet Union, uh, but also the New Deal uh, experiences in Latin America, China, and other places. Um, as well as developments in things like uh, linear programming uh, and organizational cybernetics, uh, for example. Um, and then um, there's this third planning debate that uh, Robin Hanel identifies and that he's a part of uh, that corresponds primarily to the post-Soviet period. Um, so if you look at you know, these, the images, these book covers or, or journal covers that I've included um, here, Pat Devine's book, um, which is uh, in the center. This came out in 1988. Um, Cockshot and Cottrell's uh, Towards a New Socialism in 1993. Uh, John O'Neill's in the late 90s. Uh, and there were these three science and society issues, uh, each 10 years apart. So 1992, 2002, 2012, and then one uh, recently in 2022, um, which uh, sort of we're continuing, you know, this question of, of alternatives to capitalism that were not market socialist, right? That involves uh, high degrees of, of, of democratic planning. Um, Hanel doesn't say this, um, but I wonder um, if we can start speaking of a fourth planning debate, uh, one that is much more interdisciplinary, uh, even maybe historical materialist, um, I would say. Uh, and of course, shaped by kind of our specific conjunctural realities uh, of the 21st century that were not the conjunctural realities of, of the 1990s uh, that this third planning debate was was engaging with. Uh, that's primarily climate change um, in the kind of uh, long dec the decade uh, after the 2008 financial crisis, and of course, the experiences of, of the pandemic and the emerging sort of post-pandemic order uh, that we're in. Um, now, so what is this literature? Um, I think uh, it might be helpful to give a little overview of it and to kind of situate the work that Matt and I are doing in relation to it. Um, so first, there is a dominant strand of this literature is focused on advances in the kind of computational, calculational sort of um, uh, powers of, of algorithmic technologies. Uh, drawing in particular on, on developments in the digital and platform economy. Um, and this literature takes inspiration from, uh, for example, uh, Project Cybersyn, and, and also draws attention to new uh, participatory platforms like Decidim Barcelona, uh, which we discuss in, uh, or at least comment on in, in both of our papers. Um, second, there's another strand of the literature that focuses on the more organizational dimensions of planning. 
uh, taking its cue, for instance, from developments in the in strategic management. Uh, so an example of this is Paul, Ad Paul Adler's work, um, which is this, the 99% uh, economy. Um, and also thinking about the political kind of institutional arrangements within which democratic planning might unfold. Uh, and I think the most recent example of that is uh, an article by Cedric Durand um, and, and other co-authors um, called uh, Planning Beyond Growth uh, that I'm, I'm assuming that uh, this audience might be familiar with. So that kind of provides a nice framework of, of the different levels and scales and institutions that would be involved in a kind of uh, ecological planning. Um, arguing that cap, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> arguing that capitalism is is irreducible to an economic system. Um, planning is also being sort of reframed from the standpoint of social reproduction and and the planetary household of the natural world. Um, and I see this as the argument um, that I'm making for an ecology of planning. Uh, which draws up primarily on eco-feminist and eco-Marxist uh, critique. Um, and, and that's one contribution to this primarily from a critical organization for a critical organization studies audience uh, in, in organization. And finally, uh, there's questions of space and nature are also addressed in this literature uh, with the premise that post-capitalist alternatives must reckon with the long durée uh, reconfigurations of town and countryside uh, with wilderness as their relative other. And here there's an emphasis on uh, the social metabolism of urban rural spaces uh, through which a post-capitalist planning might emerge. And these are issues that Matt and I uh, address in the Competition and Change article uh, and, and the book chapter. Um, so Matt, you can move on. Thanks. Um, so um, going back to the organization paper, um, Following this kind of the, the overview I provide of, of the Hayekian critique of planning, which is the one I focus on, uh, the paper is is broadly kind of is that that section is divided into two parts, um, each exploring kind of the organizational elements of a post-capitalist planning future. Um, and I drew on uh, Stefania Barca's idea of the forces of reproduction to kind of think about how to how to organize the literature in that sense. So while the first section places greater, greater emphasis in developments in industrial and corporate planning, uh, the second focuses on kind of the interrelated but kind of normally, normatively distinct spheres of socio-ecological reproduction. Um, I'm going to go through this a little quickly. I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. How, how much time uh, do we have left, uh, Mario? No, Just no to get worries, no worries. We're good? No worries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this uh, first section, let's say, of, of that that part of the paper deals with arguments um, uh, or the positions that that argue that we may find sort of working models of socialist planning in the very capitalist corporation itself. Um, the idea here is that um, organizational, as opposed to, as opposed to market mediations, um, are ubiquitous uh, throughout society. Uh, and that these mediations also generate, articulate, uh, and relay various types of, of social knowledge uh, across multiple scales. Um, again, the view is that we inhabit something like organizational economies. Um, this is something that Herbert Simon proposes in a 1991 paper on organization and markets. Um, and um, and that these organizational economies can be socialized and that corporate planning might hold lessons for large scale public uh, democratic planning uh, today. And this is also largely centered on the view that advances in technologies for communication and connectivity make markets uh, increasingly obsolete. So in contrast to these arguments um, that are grounded primarily on developments in the productive forces, let's say, um, the second section sees planning through a more, let's say, uh, pluralist perspective, uh, one that is grounded on the diverse values and, and reproductive relationships of uh, the oikos, um, the, 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 the sphere, the sort of the web of life, the sphere of um, uh, that encompasses all our, our, our life making practices. 
Um, and this draws attention to, for example, Ariel Salas, uh, Ariel Salas term, uh, what she terms metabolic value, uh, which can be contrasted with, with use value, um, and of course, very strongly with exchange value. Uh, and also, for instance, uh, as I mentioned, Stefania Barca's idea of the forces of reproduction, uh, which refers to the racialized, feminized, wage and unwaged, human and non-human labor, labors and agencies that essentially keep uh, the world alive and, and produce metabolic value. Uh, Matt, if you can move on to the next one. So uh, as you must, as you probably know, a common reference in the literature uh, is Project Cybersyn, um, which was led by people like uh, Stafford Beer, Fernando Flores, uh, and Raúl Espejo. Um, and there's a lot of writing, really, really interesting writing on this. Um, what I just would like to highlight is that uh, this emerged within kind of the context of Salvador Allende's program of, of democratic socialist and anti-imperialist industrial planning. Um, and, and Martina Arboleda, for example, has a really uh, an article that's really worth reading that situates planning in Chile within this kind of framework of, of national liberation struggles uh, in Latin America and beyond. Um, so, um, yeah, despite the kind of um, rudimentary to communication technologies available at the time, uh, Project Cybersyn essentially took some first steps in creating a, a planning system that aimed to kind of approximate real-time feedback and communication, uh, making use of knowledge that, as Hayek put it, was specific to time and place. Um, and Morozov, for example, um, uh, reads this kind of, um, uh, or, or appropriates Hayek's term of discovery procedure against Hayek uh, on this basis. Uh, the idea is essentially that kind of with this cybernetic system of feedback, planners can manage and mobilize emergent information, um, making it possible for workers and managers to raise concerns to higher levels of government while kind of embedding safeguards uh, to state or top-down uh, micromanagement. Um, another example that is discussed in the paper um, that um, Mario also uh, really nicely uh, comments on and, and analyzes in his paper on post-growth innovation um, is, is um, uh, the Lucas plan. Um, so, so like Project Cybersyn, uh, I think it's interesting because it, it raises questions about um, the kind of political recuperability of organizational forms and technologies. Uh, and this is something uh, addressed by what has come to be known as the uh, reconfiguration debate, uh, something Matt will also talk about. Um, and uh, so as part of this debate, um, Toscano, for instance, uh, he entertains the prospect that the capitalist firm may just be an important site um, for what he calls a practice of reconfiguration or refunctioning, uh, which involves imagining and practicing non-capitalist uses of, of capitalist technologies and infrastructures. Um, and the example um, that Toscano identifies is uh, as a precursor to this sort of practice is, is, is the Lucas plan. Um, essentially, what the Lucas plan proposed was a shift from, from militarized market production to socially useful production uh, based on Lucas's technologies and competencies um, and through worker self-management. Uh, and, and, and this shift away from militarized market production is, of course, um, something uh, on, uh, on a lot of people's minds right now, uh, thinking about uh, you know, the occupation and the genocide in Gaza and, and other uh, similar um, uh, cases around the world. Um, so I just, I just wanted to uh, point that out. Um, the kind of uh, relevance, the continued relevance of, of uh, the experiment of, of the Lucas plan. Um, now, uh, while this kind of proposed shift to, to socially useful production failed to, to materialize, um, given the political institutional circumstances of the period, uh, its epistemologically plural and, and popular politics of defense conversion also makes it an appropriate example uh, for the kind of uh, changes needed for a democratic, democratically planned uh, socio-ecological transition. Um, and um, and this brings us to kind of uh, the the 
the case of, of or the example of the Greater London Council. So within the history of municip municipalist praxis, um, the GLC, the Greater London Council of the 1980s, is a kind of famous example of a municipalist attempt to rethink economic planning at the metropolitan scale. Um, so drawing on the experiences of the Lucas Plan to develop a popular planning for social need at the level of the firm, the GLC sort of created new administrative bodies like the Popular Planning Unit um, that aim to essentially make planning more open to associational civil society, uh, making use of sort of the creative capacity capacities and power uh, of the civil economy. Um, and, and Pat Devine also um, comments on the GLC and his book on, on economic planning, um, uh, which, you know, he sees the GLC essentially as um, initiating a process of popular planning in which power was shared by various stakeholders, uh, workers, users, uh, and communities, and uh, and everyone who would kind of be involved in, in drawing up strategic plans for particular workplaces, industries, uh, localities, and so on. Um, all these examples, I think, um, are, you know, they were, they were, uh, remained mostly, you know, um, visions rather than becoming realities and, and, and uh, fully materializing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, thinking of Neurath, um, these are visions of, you know, um, a kind of planning that would enable us to, to be free, in his words, to an extent hardly ever heard before. Uh, making a multiplicity of ways of life possible, uh, non-conformism su conform conformism supported by sort of planned institutions. Um, given sort of uh, you know thinking of the of the, the lost these lost futures of planning, um, you know one's reminded of this this quote from from Benjamin, um, which is you know the, the, to articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it the way it really was. Uh, it means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. Um, you can move on, uh, Matt. And you know, with with that in mind, um, the question that the article then tries to address is how to kind of think these alternatives, these these al planning alternatives, uh, and, and, uh, and and the possibility for for democratic planning uh, in our present moment. Um, so ultimately, the article kind of aimed to situate this diverse planning literature um, and the examples, uh, uh, examples like the ones just mentioned within the, the matrix of, of the oikos, uh, which um, I understand as the household of social reproduction and the planetary household of, of the natural world. Um, and this implies uh, rethinking planning from the standpoint of sort of the co-constitutive relationships between uh, the economy and its so-called non-economic others. Um, uh, this is something central to feminist and ecological critiques of capitalism. And, uh, you know, these images, I'm sure this audience is very, you know, uh, aware and, and aware of and familiar with um, that I thought, you know, might help illustrate this. Um, so, so drawing on, for example, Nancy Fraser, uh, for instance, capitalism can be understood as an institutionalized social order, uh, something that's irreducible to an economic system, something that's irreducible to just the, the capital labor relation. Um, and, and capitalism's crisis driven tendencies um, can then be understood as Nancy Fraser puts it, uh, resulting from the um, from from its cannibalization of of its ontologically and uh, economically devalued and thereby concealed sort of conditions of possibility, which are social, political, and ecological. Um, similarly, Jason Moore, who has also been an influence on our work, argues that while the history of capitalism flows through islands of commodity production, uh, commodity production develops within oceans of uh, unpaid work energy. Um, and, and, and these sort of frameworks, I think, allow us to see capitalism as irreducible to kind of its economic moment um, and, and to thereby situate the economy and the market uh, within its more expansive conditions of reproduction. Right. So I think on this basis, uh, what we're trying to do is, is to move to, to, to rethink planning beyond just the critique of the market and the economy uh, and to situate 
it, this this economic moment of capital within this these this more expansive set of, of value relations. Um, yeah, so in this way, um, you know, um, what I was trying to say is uh, we, ascend, we, we can understand the history of capitalism through the lens of the capital nature relation. Um, and this also shows how kind of the separation uh, from of, of humans and humanity from the conditions of life is related to um, uh, it's the subordination of life making practices to forms of market dependency and is linked to the exhaustion and destruction uh, of the natural world. So the question is, you know, how how might we rethink economic planning from the standpoint um, of these more expansive value relations that encompass both human and extra human work um, that are necessary to um, uh, the circuit of capital and, and the production of value, but are in some kind of outside, you know, uh, external relation uh, to them. Um, um, so just to just to conclude, um, just to sum up what I what I uh, just uh, uh, alluded to here, um, the argument is that democratic planning must see the sphere of production, the spheres of production, as dialectically interwoven with the households of reproductive labor and the planetary household of the natural world. Um, and um, I've included some things here, which you know I don't think I can speak to in detail um, given the time, but I'm happy to come back to. Um, um, and, and these sort of, uh, I think, address, you know, what this democratic, democratically planned econo economy um, would imply. Um, just be before handing the presentation over to Matt, um, I'd like to uh, sum, sum up what I just said by suggesting that the most compelling arguments for planning today begin with a critique of the kind of capitalogenic causes of the climate crisis um, and the inadequacy and injustice of uh, neo-colonial state productivist and market mediated mechanisms for trying to avoid uh, ecological overshoot. Um, uh, building on this, uh, the work that you know, Matt and I are doing uh, and that you know, Matt will be speaking to uh, begins with the assumption that uh, one must attend to the urban rural realities of the capital nature relation um, as central to deepening or healing um, planetary metabolic rifts. Um, and furthermore, we take uh, logistics and logistical power uh, as central to um, urban agrarian municipalist politics. Um, with planning as necessary for regaining control over metabolism um, from capital. And one way that, um, as mentioned, Matt and I suggest this can be thought of is by looking into historical and contemporary examples of municipalist praxis, um, some of which I, I, um, I just commented on. Um, so Matt, uh, over to you. Um, Great, thanks Yusuf. Right, so if you sort of raise some questions there about the, the issue of mediation and um, metabolism, our relationship to nature in terms of the way we reproduce our lives and livelihoods, um, that's kind of the basis, I guess. That's the starting point for us when we when we when we work together on this article in in the competition and change special issue. We're thinking about um, the the urban form that mediates. Um, our relationship to nature and the conditions of possibility for our survival as human as, as humanity and nature. Now I can't. Can anyone? I can't see anyone, right? So if if I, if you can't hear me, or I'm speaking too quickly, or I go over time. Um, please shout because I can't see anyone grimacing, laughing, miming, or anything. I'm I'm blind due to my technological <laughs> inadequacy in sharing screens. I can't work out. I can't see anyone. So we'll just we'll just see we'll, we'll see what happens. But we start with the reconfiguration thesis, right? So. We, we we start this paper and these this kind of debate the, the way that we're thinking these things through with this debate within post-capitalism within marxist communization thesis type work uh, and we use the examples of toscano and, and jasper burns i guess as these kind of protagonists and antagonists in this debate which is around whether well, the logistics planetary logistics supply chains that basically wrap us together and knit us into integrated networks of production and, and exchange and distribution in a capitalist sense, whether they are reconfigurable, whether we can reconfigure them for post-capitalist ends or some kind of like 
some kind of socially just metabolic form of, of existence. Now, Burns says, no, we can't. Toscano says, perhaps we can. Burns suggests that they're constitutively hostile, these, these infrastructures. And he, he, has, he, does it, he does it through three arguments. One is around the holistic design of logistics in which they, they integrate, logistics integrates workers and suppresses wages and exploits uneven development in ways which is very difficult to break through. The scale of that, so the sheer planetary scale and systemic integration imposes huge operational barriers and issues around complexity, opacity. Basically it's illegible and it's unintelligible and incredibly complex for any kind of co collective action, any kind of economic planning to, to navigate or get hold of. And lastly, he talks about the place-based nature of revolutionary struggle in history. It doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen across the world. It happens at one place, then it gets replicated or, imit or imitated, or a wave breaks through. But the problem it emerges if you're in, within the grid of planetary logistics, how do you feed the revolutionaries? So that's the basis that he then builds with other colleagues, this argument around agricultural revolution, suggesting that the, post, the break from capitalism will have to be an agrarian revolution a revolution built around food, the belly of the revolution, as this article is, is named. So if we think about the Neolithic agricultural revolution, which tethered hunter gatherers to feudalism and personal domination, and then we have the capitalist agricultural revolution, which through the enclosure of the commons cut peasants free from those bonds, but <clears throat> re-tethered them to structural forms of domination, what Soren Mao has called the mute compulsion of capitalism, we would likewise need to have an agricultural revolution for post-capitalism which would cut us th free of those tethers of both, both personal and, and uh, impersonal domination in this way. So food is fundamental. And I think this speaks to us around um, that metabolic issue uh, of, of, of how economic planning would have to deal with the kind of fundamentals of life, I guess, in our relationship to nature. But is this all there is, right? So I guess a lot of our interest here is, is, food, is food enough? Is that, is that the basis of this? Do we have to sort of think about the actual forms that exist within capital at present and, and, and work through them, or do we escape the grid entirely? This is the big debate. So I, I can't dwell on this too much, but this is, I guess, inspired by Henri Lefebvre's work on abstract space and planetary urbanization. We, think, we can think of planetary logistics and supply chains as a kind of abstraction, as a, a naked, empty social space stripped bare of symbols. It acts to homogenize and divide, compartmentalizes units into exchangeable, um, interchangeable units for global market exchange. We can think about this in terms of containerization, for instance, as this image shows. So Toscano builds on this and says the logistical state today is working to recreate this abstraction through spaces of stocks and flows for, for optimizing capitalist relations. So breaking free, it's very difficult to, to break free of this, we, we, we understand in, in terms of thinking with Jasper Burns on this. And it gets more difficult, right? So if you think about what, 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 what people in geography are talking about at the moment in terms of supply chain urbanism, build riffing on supply chain capitalism, we can think about the growth of the city and urban form today is inseparable from the rise of logistics. So cities become conduits and transistors for the faster flow of capital. We think about warehouses, agglomerations of capital, ports, infrastructures, data centers as, as propelling stuff around the world. But we can also think of them as being major obstacles to circulation. We can think of blockades, occupations, stoppages, riots, as Joshua Clover characterises this era of um, collective action as opposed to the strike. But is this enough? So Toscano's main concern, I guess, with this debate is about whether these things actually, things like blockades, like our Oakland Port blockade that Jasper Burns took, took, took part in in the early 2000s, do they really transform a social form that animates these objects or are they just fetishizing the physical objects of circulation themselves? You know, are we just basically stopping a container port from having more containers come through it? The, the flow, the actual form behind that is, is intact. It's still moving stuff around the world um, behind our backs, as Marx might say. Um, so what would it mean, Toscano says, to struggle not simply against material flows, but against the social forms that channel them? What do we mean by social forms? I guess we're, work, we're riffing off of the open Marxism tradition and, and, and form analysis rooted in the Frankfurt School critical theory. And we can think, I guess Richard Guns is a, is a good metaphor, which I've, I've borrowed and I've stolen from, from colleagues from, from Harry Pitts and uh, Lorena Lombardozzi's work on this, which they use, they use this metaphor, it's, it's, it's great. So we think about a rope linking two climbers 
being constitutive of the relation in which they stand that that thing that rope that me that that thing is the is the mode of existence of that of that relation it's the form that those climbers take they couldn't exist without each other holding each other up with this rope um, and it's that mediation is that is the form through which that activity operates and we can think about that in the same way with capitalism right that money is the form in which exchange takes place wage labor is the form through which work happens and the way in which we transform energy um, matter from 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 nature into energy and it takes a specific form wage labor which contains contradictions between labor and capital and those contradictions create uh, and animate that form and the state likewise is the political form of um, capital in which those contradictions are animated in political and power and violent terms so what's the spatial form of capitalism basically i guess we're basically asking well hang on if planet planetary logistics pulls us all in together and it's very difficult to resist this is this part of the spatial form of capitalism and that's kind of the basis that's the argument we make in this article that drawing on lefebvre's work we, we're trying to get a sense of what the spatial form the urban form of capital might take and therefore how we might work through those forms like we should work through the form of money like we should work through the form of the state in order to kind of um transform it um that's 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 the basis that's the basis we take so lefebvre going back to this work in 1970 on on the urban revolution talks about the complete sub subordination of the agrarian countryside to the urban he talks about planetary urbanization as the spatial form of capitalism emerging quite extraordinary using this implosion explosion metaphor as, as it's as it's written here in this uh, intriguing little note about the evolution of urbanism and that's been taken up recently by lots of urbanists critical urban scholars geographers people like neil brenner christian christian schmidt writing about <coughs> taking that metaphor implosion explosion suggesting this is what planetary urbanization is today it's a dialectic a kind of dynamic relation between an implosive form of urbanization and an explosive form and the implosive form is the agglomeration, the centrality, the density that we might associate with city centres and the citadel, the metropolis, the nodes, the nodes, if you like, in the transistor circuit of planetary urbanisation that propels supply chains. But they also the, that's also that also raises the issue of, of proximity, encounter, cooperation, struggle, the resistance that we might have to that system is also built on the on the on that kind of force the gravitational pull towards the center think about collective action it happens it happens in squares it happens through interaction and encounter with people but their argument is that the that the urban studies and uh, has has not attended enough to the other form of urbanization the explosive form the extended urbanization so not just suburbs not just infrastructural corridors but going out into the wilderness into the into the countryside the operational landscapes that support agglomerations. So Martin Arboleda has talked about the planetary mine, We're talking about the extraction of materials from all sorts of parts of the world that we wouldn't ordinarily think of as being as being urban, but they support the urban and they support the urban form of capital, which is built on this um, on this dialectic of flow and fixity. So going thinking about thinking thinking back to Jasper Byrne's argument about the tight integration of planetary supply chains that they're that, that labour wages and labour resistance is suppressed through this integration in the system, you can start to get a sense of, of the way this flow and fixity operates, the way that you need more fixed infrastructure to propel things faster around the world, capital people ideas, and it's breaking free of that grid, as, as he calls it, which is the tricky thing. Do we need to escape the grid, as Burns suggests we do, and move in towards localised, bioregional, networks of self-sufficiency or as Toscano suggests do we work through the form to reimagine and reach and transform the contours of the form itself which is no which is a tricky thing to imagine right I don't I don't know how we do that but we've got others working in this field who are thinking about, about that right so people like Mazadra and Nielsen saying that we need to uh, reinvent the Soviet we need to build a stable system of counterpowers alongside um planetary urbanization whilst also attacking its constituted its constituted power at the center it's the only strategy they see is viable this 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 relates very much to dual power and municipalism so municipalism is a kind of movement that's emerged uh, influenced by people like Murray Bookchin and only Henri Lefebvre but mostly Bookchin's ideas obviously going back to Lenin and Lenin's idea about dual power in the Soviet in the Soviets uh, in the Russian Revolution 
thinking about creating a confederation of communes, a kind of commune form as an alternative to capitalism in the shell of the old on the one hand, and then at the same time, or in parallel kind of dual power strategy, taking hold of local political institutions like Barcelona on Camus, for instance, recently, well, in, the, in, in historical terms, recently taking control of, of Barcelona City Council and then supporting the commune through the power that might might be generated through that, that, that double approach. I haven't got time to look into this, but this is basically thinking about Eric Odin Wright's ideas around taming and eroding rather than smashing or escaping. So thinking about um, using the state and dual power strategy terms to reform, maybe green, the Green New Deal, for instance, whilst also eroding capitalism from within by working through its forms working through the form of money, working through the form of the state, working through the form, as we would like to suggest in this in, the, in these few papers, working through the form of the urban, the space, the spatial form of capital, by reimagining the, the, the structure, um, the, the, man the manifest kind of concrete materialization <coughs> that capitalism takes. And in all this, we have to be we have to be careful to remember the libidinal energies of everyday life, I guess. Working through forms is difficult when we're talking about people's attachment to things like money, for instance, as, as, as Martin Connings has written in this incredible book. Money is very like deeply interwoven into the social fabric of everyday life in late capitalism. And it's something that he describes progressives have missed. You know, the iconic power, the symbolic power and the effective attachments that people have to money as the kind of currency of everyday life is something that particularly Polanyan thought this chat about disembedding and alienation misses to its great disadvantage and I guess we, we're we working with some of these ideas to think through how we would confront neoliberalism and, and, and capital and transform those forms at the at the level of everyday life what would it mean to do that and it brings us to some of the uh, some of the the early kind of historical genesis of municipalism as a movement going back to the houses of the people so Margaret Cohen's written this incredible history of Emilia Romagna cooperative federations built around houses of the people. These are spaces of popular encounter, self-provisioning. So it's a bit about escape, but it's also working through the forms too by inventing new kinds of work, new kinds of exchange. But there are also spaces of collective festivity, uh, identity formation, political education. People came together to have fun, uh, get drunk together. Uh, there's a jouissance to this, which I think is lacking perhaps in a lot of um, political movements today. Um, is, this is kind of tapping into those libidinal energies uh, and thinking about how to um, create and sustain kind of popular attachment to, to new forms that might break the stranglehold of planetary urbanisation. And obviously municipalism is, is inspired ultimately by the 1871 Paris Commune. Kristin Ross has written a lot about this, about schools of the people, um, about revolutionary clubs and uh, and buzzing hives of subversive political activity, bringing diverse people together, and they they became the space to to form new subjectivities around planning, um, cooperative design, socially useful industrial design, for instance. Back in the these this period was 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 experimented with in ways which foreshadowed the GLC and the Lucas plan to come. So is this a template for municipalist assemblies that might then think we might better break through and transform the form, the spatial form of planetary urbanisation? So we're basically playing with those ideas at the moment. We're playing with the ideas that municipalism could be a hacking of the urban form by reinventing the, the commune at, at nodes and agglomerations. But also, what about this other uh, uh, unthought through, I think, really relatively recently, it's starting to be thought, thought through by colleagues in, in, uh, in Argentina in particular, which I'll talk about in a second, about reappropriating the supply chains and the extending infrastructures that support urban agglomeration. How do we democratize urban explosions, basically? Can we communize these, these extensions, these infrastructures in, in the way that municipalism seeks to do ordinarily at, of urban centers and, and, uh, and, and assemblies? So this brings us to supply chain municipalism. Can supply chain municipalism exist in today's world? It's still raised, the same questions that are raised by Jasper Burns are still haunting us here. Like he would suggest that no, you know, the just-in-time production systems cannot be broken through municipalizing supply chains which are, are run by corporations and backed by the logistical state with its violence its mandate on violence but nonetheless in places like rosario in argentina um, i think in catalonia as well there's issues there's 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 some experimentation in the, in in this direction around networked co cooperative federations of family farmers for instance municipal food companies public food companies coming together at federate 
uh, confederated by regional levels to localize and ecologize, if you like, supply chains to make them to make our metabolism with nature um, more sustainable and to democratize the conditions for, our, for the reproduction of our of our life and livelihoods. I think metabolism is something that's key to all this. I haven't got time to go into this, but we can we can think building on the likes of Moore and Mao recently, we, you know, unearthing some of Marx's work and thinking through that. We can think about the city and urban infrastructures as a kind of vast extroverted exoskeletal system of human metabolism of social metabolism they are you know they are they are our organs that have been extroverted outside of our bodies you know clothing and shelter are are our external fur as more says so thinking about tools technologies from housing to money to logistical networks as these kind of metabolic infrastructures is the way that we we're, we're thinking this through and, and the way that perhaps municipalism or other kinds of struggles, metabolic struggles, might begin to, to, to work through these forms. And I, I won't go into this, I haven't got time, but I think the last, the last uh, roll of the dice, I guess, the last cut or window into this is to think through the metabolic rift and the spatialization of that metabolic rift in the town and country antithesis that Marx and Engels first alerted us to. <clears throat> The way the town and country divide was created and, and exacerbated through through capitalism, through enclosures and then industrialization, and that broke the soil the soil cycle, the, the nitrogen cycle, and is now responsible for you know the the carbon cycle being damaged and leading to climate change. So it's about synthesizing this. How do we synthesize it? If we're working towards a metabolic municipalism. Are we talking about synthesizing the urban and the rural as agroecological work is beginning to think through? Are we talking about urban agriculture and urban greening? Or can we actually sustain some kind of some kind of dual system of agglomeration and extension? This kind of flow and fixity, this this kind of explosive implosive urbanisation that capitalism has given us. Are we talking about bioregional urban metabolisms at the scale of watersheds and biomes? Um, would or if if we are talking about that, is that uh, is that not just what Jasper Burns was saying originally by saying escaping from the grid? Can we link up these bioregional urban metabolisms at a planetary scale? If we did that, we'd have to reconfigure and get hold of these technologies for democratic planning, algorithm, algorithmic technologies, computation, computational tech for planning and coordinating this kind of trade. Fine, sure, the trade wouldn't occur through through monetary networks or, or the commodity form. It would have to occur through other other means, and it wouldn't be based on you know, fossil energy, you would have to utilize different kinds of technologies, but would that not lead us back into the same, you know, with solar cells and the kind of technologies that would, might propel the kind of long distance trade we're talking about, might not that, might not that lead us back into the same trap of planetary mine that Arbaleda talks about in terms of the extraction of rare minerals and, and metals at, um, at frontier zones, which, which is also extractive and, and basically damaging and breaking the, the, the metabolic relation with other nature. So I guess I'll leave it there with these questions and directions. I'm sorry for, sorry for going over, over really with our, with our time, but hopefully that, that provides you with, with an overview and a few, <clears throat> a few questions maybe that you might, you might be able to direct our way or is there any, what have we missed? What, what are we, are we barking up the wrong tree? Let me have a look. Let me, let me see if I can, stop sharing my screen <laughs> okay wow thank you very much i think this was a very very complete overview of the the planning debates and uh, the lecture in my mind uh raised more question than uh than uh, certain things i would say <laughs> there is a lot of uh, things there and uh, as you correctly say the, the debate is, is, is old. No? It's been like more than a couple of centuries of, de of debating how we can uh, organize uh, production uh, central from central planning to more, more uh, distributed kind of planning. Okay, so I would open the, the debate. Uh, we have uh, here our PhD students, postdoctoral students, and all of, of us on different uh, levels work with the, the notion of, uh, I also in some cases share some of the of your literature. And I see that uh, Joe wants to have a question. Joe, yeah, uh, um, thank you both so much. I think that was, I'm a bit overwhelmed just by the amount of like theory and names that I maybe also, I'm not from planning, so um, it was super interesting. Thank you a lot. 
I think there's something that came up for me kind of throughout the the presentation around co-optation um, of how do you like what's your kind of take on co-optation especially in the last part now that there was this um, aspect on um, where I wrote it down what you called it smash and eroding um, and this to me seemed a little bit as like this like absolutist approach of we have to find the answer so it either has to go like go back to the commune or we have to have this this approach where we centralized plan which to me both is a very status central planning approach which I personally don't share so I I guess I wonder like how yeah what's your relation to co-optation is that does that come up for you and how do you respond to that <coughs> Okay, so quick follow up on the or reply to the question. Um, I can I have some maybe a response to that. I don't know if Matt you yeah can okay. take. Um, <clears throat> I mean, so I'm I'm doing research on on what you can call we can call the kind of municipalist effort to to rethink planning uh, in Barcelona, and and when I talk to members of the social solidarity economy, this always comes up. So there, there is a kind of, um, I don't know, skepticism or, or, um, uh, or concern of, of engaging with the state or even engaging with, with the public sector. Um, although there are many examples to draw on, um, like the city in Barcelona would be one, and, and there are sort of efforts to develop like public common partnerships, um, which I would see as, as, as contributing to this effort to rethink planning. Um, but again, the other the other issue is, you know, there. I don't think um, so. I think it's important to have a kind of pluralist conception of what the economy is, and this means that we also have many different kinds of planning uh, coexisting in the economy. So um, we wouldn't, I, I think, planning with the public sector or a public sector enterprise would look quite different from from planning with a more kind of local, smaller scale al alternative. Um, and of course, there are many other empirical questions. Um, to answer this, I think these are these are primarily practical rather than theoretical questions that we need to kind of explore um, through concrete examples. Um, <clears throat> so yes, of course, co-optation is is a is a concern, um, but but I, I don't think that um, uh, we are arguing for like a single model of planning that is state-centered or centralized, um, and and definitely there, there would be more distributed forms of associational planning that can coexist in in kind of um, uh, what we're um, interested in exploring um, and, and, and studying more. I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are you said now? Yeah. Hi. Thank you both. Uh, I have um, a question that comes from my observation of some rural areas I'm focused on for my PhD research. Uh, do you think that um, the place that in urban areas is um, uh, occupied by social movements and the reivindication that social movement can uh, somehow create um, is being occupied in these last years uh, in the rural areas by um, the third sector, for example, and what kind of role uh, can this third sector have to create maybe a connection with the revendication that uh, in urban areas are taken on by the movement, if they are useful for this, if they are a positive actor or not? Because I have many doubts about this uh, subject of the third sector in rural areas. Thank you. Okay. So who is going to? Um, so uh, I don't know, Matt. Did, did you want to respond I mean, to that? I, I I don't quite know what you mean in terms of the third sector in rural areas. What is in charities, social enterprises, co-ops um, operating in rural spaces in relation to to the urban and and joining up those struggles, or 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 what? What was the question uh, sort of um, geared toward thinking about the role of the third sector and, and how they can connect things or the way in which the third sector operates? So could you could you elaborate a little bit? Uh, 
I mean, whether they are um, being a subject of uh, progress for the rural areas or they are working for uh, purposes that are not really connected to the interests of local communities because maybe they are somehow manipulating those interests. I mean, I, I can speak to that in urban areas. I mean, I don't do much work on rural areas, unfortunately. This is the problem with urban studies. People they only look at urban stuff. They don't look at rural stuff. And actually something that the planetary urbanisation thesis is trying to break down. So we need to look at both. Right. But I, I look at the third sector in, 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 in urban regenerations, thinking about urban regeneration and thinking about urban governance in places in, in London, for instance, and other, other areas. And I, I think I think the third sector has interests in it, has class interests which are distinct often. They often wrapped up in a kind of professional managerial class kind of relation, I think, to capital and labour, which is somehow bridging that gap. And they, they often work in in um, sort of high pressured and sort of precarious conditions around grant around grants and chasing commissions. And we can think about that as being around a projectariat or, or kind of project logic and projectification of of these sorts, these sorts of organisation. So they're always they're always working to project timelines and objectives, which might have funders backing them or governments or charities or whatever, who stipulate certain who runs them as well. You've got to think about who runs them. What are they trying to what are they trying to commission in the first place? Uh, and whose interests are any of these people working for when there's a kind of often it's working for expertise and the continued role of expertise in those spaces, which aren't necessarily about emancipatory issues around people's actual class interests in those spaces. So I think there's a real, I think that's a really important point and the mediation of the third sector becoming increasingly common in across, I guess it sounds like it is in the rural spaces too, as well as, as the urban spaces that I look at, but um, there are all sorts of agencies operating that fill the gap and mediate between the state and civil society, um, which I think needs to be looked into and, 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 and how that relates to things like municipalist struggles is also fascinating because a lot of municipalist struggles are backed by third sector actors or they come out of think tanks or they come out of charities they've worked in NGOs for a number of years and that's how that that's particularly in somewhere like Zagreb in post-Yugoslav space um, that struggle is really mobilized and animated by people who've come through the third sector and that changes the form that that struggle then takes I think um, compared to say tradition compared to the GLC in the 1980s in London where people weren't coming out of that sector, they were coming out of community development. Maybe it was much more informal, or they were coming out of local government, or they, you know, they were, it was much more grassroots. But anyway, I won't, I won't waffle on. Um. Thank you. Okay, there is Sophia with a question. Hi, uh, morning. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. I am a historian of urbanism, so I found it really um, stimulating. And I love the quote that you brought up at the beginning by Walter Benjamin about the ways that we invoke the past um, in moments of danger, often recasts it in the image that we want. Um, this is something that I'm thinking about um, in relation to degrowth because there's a kind of emerging um, question of how can we look at the past and learn from its mistakes and maybe find models for, for planning. And um, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about maybe if you'd come across examples of planning projects that have, you know, taken a past example and put it into practice in their work, or if there's a discussion about like, okay, this was a good city in the past and and we want to adapt that as a model for what we're doing. Thanks. Um, I mean, so in the case of the GLC, um, it, uh, I think some of the people involved in the GLC, or not I think, I know some of the people that were involved in the GLC were also involved with the efforts um, or the struggles around the Lucas Plan. Uh, and the Lucas Plan's idea of like um, of shifting away from militarized market production towards production for social need um, is kind of what informed this the slogan of, of popular planning for social need. Um, so there is a, is a link to, you know, from there's a direct link between those two you know, examples that I spoke of, which were only a few years apart um, and um, were also you know, in the same national context. Um, but uh, in, in conversations with, with Hilary Wainwright uh, that I've had, she, she did also say that the GLC was quite inspired by Project Cybersyn and, and efforts uh, in Chile. Um, 
specifically how I, I I actually I'm I'm not sure I, I I see it because they they didn't have this kind of um, program of, of developing a kind of cybernetic protocol or, or tool to mediate planning. Um, but I think maybe it it is sort of clear in the sense of uh, well you know we need to imagine a kind of decentral form of planning. Uh, perhaps that's something to to ask her in, in a conversation or a few weeks. Um, and uh, and then uh, there is Decidim Barcelona, which is quite popular, uh, I think, or, or, or I can, has received a lot of recognition. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. So it's a kind of public common uh, partnership or alliance. Um, uh, it's a it's an open source, open code um, decision making platform. Um, and at least, you know, in terms of thinking about, if not um, operationally or in terms of the, the concrete potentials of the platform as, as it exists, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, thinking of a recovery of a lost future, I know that, you know, they have referenced Project Cybersyn. Um, I've seen them use the imagery of Cybersyn in, in presentations and so on. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but but at the level of imaginaries, I think it's it's there in, in something like this in Barcelona. Um, and in the case of the GLC, I think it's perhaps because some of the same people were involved um, in, in these struggles. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't think of other examples on the spot, but um, I hope that sort of answers the question. I'm sure there are there are many other examples um, um, because I mean we are only addressing um, a few sort of you know very euro eurocentric cases of of planning, very localized cases, uh, with the exception of Project Cybersyn. But but there are many sort of international experiences to draw on, especially in the post World War II period, from let's say the 40s to the 70s. Um, in Latin America, China, and so on. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, any other question? Well, I, no? I, I have many questions, but I will limit uh, <laughs> to just two. And uh, I know that uh, you guys are coming for uh, to the conference in Pontevedra, at least Joseph. No, or Matthew, you are, are you coming as well? Okay, so we can have more time to discuss uh, if you want. So my two question, and I have many, I have more than 10, but I'll try to select and uh, on, only two. The first one is that it's a, it seems to me that uh, most of the big, you know, the biggest economy, uh, the biggest econ economic conglomerates like the EU, for example, the US, and not even to talk about China, are still de facto functioning as as um, as planned econo economic system. No, you mentioned some of the the republic, uh, the People's Republic of uh, Walmart. No, or in, in this book they they make this point. Uh, or oh, even Noam Chomsky talk about the fact that the U.S. is uh, preaching free market, but mm. essentially is is a kind of a plan central uh, centrally uh, control a plan economy. That serves capital systems, capital system. No. So my first question is how how to make this uh, this discourse of uh, democratic planning appealing to the policymaker and political party? Because it seems to me that it's really taboo. At least in Europe, it's really taboo talking about planning. And I'm, I'm coming from uh, my previous life when I was a teenager. I was very active in the Communist Party in Italy. Then the Communist Party transformed into something different. Now it's called Democratic Party, like in the US, but essentially it's a, it's a right wing neoliberal party. Uh, and they completely remove any discourse about uh, even democratic uh, planning, even though most of the, of, the, uh, of the policy that they implemented then when they uh, got into the power. Uh, in the 90s and at in the, in the, in the beginning of this century, were basic somehow on forms of uh, kind of planning, no? Like very, very aligned with the European Union. So this is the first question. So how strategically we in academia, but also as a, in some of us are also in uh, very much active in, in different social movements like the growth and others, and the social movements. How can we like, make this democratic planning appealing for 
for policymakers and political party. And the second question is more theoretical question, more it's a more kind of theoretical question. Most of the work that you presented can be situated, the vast majority, within Marxism or eco-Marxism or eco-socialism, or at least they have a critical realism ontology, kind of ontology, right? Here in the group, we are a very diverse group. So we are people that are on, on this side, but also a lot of people that, that are more on post-structuralism and social constructionist idea. And when we are talking about the fact that now we have the computational power to make this dream of Allende possible or to make to make uh, Soviet Union planning working properly, uh, we are, we are uh, relying a lot on the algorithm and, and, and technology, basically. It's a technological pro project, right? And if you accept the findings or the proposition from STS uh, and all the tradition of uh, social construction of technology, I know that there is also a Marxist STS. But the, 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 the core of STS is a social uh, constructionist uh, vision of technology. It means that's when you are designing technology, when you are designing this algorithm that are designed to, you know, allocate uh, routes and production and to, to, to understand how it's possible to plan production with the specific goal, the risk is also to embed biases, right? Because this is the this is the lesson from STS, not the fact that whatever whatever you you the design of technology is always biased by the values of the people who design it, right? And we see it with now with uh, facial, uh, facial recognition algorithm, artificial intelligence, all the ethics around surrounding artificial intelligence. There are people like start talking about the fact that you know the algorithm are not neutral. There are political racial biases. All the work that has been done on the on on the use of technology by Israel and on Gaza and 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 the West Bank. How all this technology now has been used for many other reasons and have been tested there. And the purpose was to control uh, genocide, as you correctly say. So, how all this de debate of uh, uh, democratic planning engaged with the STS findings? I think this is something that you don't mention in the, in the presentation that is super relevant, especially if connected to my first point. If you want to communicate this to the policymaker, or if you want to put this in our political project as a social movement, we need to be aware that if we are going to use algorithm to allocate goods or, or to plan production, how we do that, you know, how we do that, trying to avoid uh, avoid the fact that the Google driveless car were at the beginning were not able to distinguish between black and uh, black people and a tree, for example. Right? Because the the, the pro programmer they were all white and they trained the algorithm with the, with people that look like them, right? Mm -hmm. So technology is not neutral. So technology that we use to plan, even if the democratic planning will be somehow affected by, by this, because this is technology at the end of the day. Okay. Let them uh, answer that. Maybe we can. Yeah. Matt, do you want to go or should I? I mean, I can I can say like, well, yeah, well, what a question. I mean, uh, Technology. I mean, it's way outside of my my comfort zone. But of course, like uh, technology is key. Expertise is key. Technocracy, dare I say, it, is key to this in many ways because the complexity. If we're going to this reconfiguration debate can be quite basic in many ways, can't it? It sort of says, well, a bit like the state. The form analysis behind it is basically saying the state and logistics and computers and the internet is unreconfigurable because it somehow uh, expresses, articulates the contradictory social form of capital. I mean, it's a little bit, it's a bit crude. I mean, we can surely pick it apart and and open the box with the right with the right expertise and then to push it in different directions. And I think this is at the heart of municipalism as a as a movement and ideology, it's, it's huge tension between democracy, between the assembly and the deliberative delegated power of people who the popular people who don't necessarily have any kind of like expertise in this area. And then those that they delegate for doing this stuff, like the administrators, the technocrats, the experts, the scientists, the, te the technologists who can actually do this stuff. I think that relationship is, is yet to be really fully worked through. But I think it's that it's in those it's in those deliberative experimental spaces of, of planning that have to somehow reflect and channel popular desires and all those issues around social justice that you've just brought up. 
um, in ways that can somehow feed into those that that that, re, that technological reinvention of the internet, for instance. Because we don't, the internet is an incredibly powerful tool that we you don't want to jettison. It's crazy to think to escape from the grid when we've got the grid can help us, you know, get out of this mess. Um, it's kind of where we're going down this route. But yeah, I think the STS Marxism divide is is a big problem. Um, Perhaps someone like Martin Arboleda starts to push towards some kind of conversation in that in that respect. I think but I don't have an easy answer for you, I'm afraid. As usual, it's the <coughs> usual classic one. It's like, oh no, I don't know. And and to your other question, I guess, um, how do we how do we make this stuff appealing to policymakers? I don't know. I guess it's the same old thing, isn't it? Degrowth, post growth, good growth, green growth, whatever. Um, the endless discussions over whether degrowth is a is a discourse is right and you know I mean I'm not going to go down that route but I think there are people there are these prolif proliferation of, of of models and imaginaries now since 2008 and particularly since 2015 which starts uh, which 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 gesture at planning but then don't necessarily bring planning directly into the center of that imaginary so for instance Mariana Mazzucato's uh, mission economy stuff which uses the man on the moon imagery uh, from America's heyday, you know, NASA's kind of power to computational power and all, quite frankly, just just organizational power, coordination planning to get that, to get this incredible thing happening. She uses that the stuff, doesn't she, to basically sell this idea to the EU and to, to nation states in particular and various other international agencies that you can somehow but again, it's not thought through. Like, how would you like you have, you coordinate all these diverse interests who are who are actually mediated by the money by the money form still, and and the state form, and somehow coordinate them around a mission by convincing everyone we share this goal. And it's quite it becomes a bit thin and glib at that point. It's like, well, well, we all want to live in a nice world where we move past global climate change. But how how does that mission actually get formulated? Um, does it get formulated through policy in the states? Is it just a case of command, or is it something else? Is it is it convening, curating shared interests through, through what though? Through what procedures and mechanisms? Um, so that's in, that's that. I think there's a black box there, but it is interesting that that stuff's taken has gained traction, along with, you know, my work looks at the very local level, which is I guess why I'm interested in municipalism. It's less state oriented, but thinking about community wealth building, the foundational economy not just degrowth but post-growth perspectives the caring economy there's this whole like host of new economic imaginaries which are putting planning back into this and thinking about how we might use in very sort of in in, in quite tentative ways like procurement cycles of, of anchor institutions or local state organizations or corporations that are rooted to place how do we start thinking about supply chains and metabolic um, and procurement cycles and redirecting some of those contracts to and i think those kind of things can be Within the, within the politics of the possible at the moment, those sort of things can be easily sold to um, to policymakers. But it's it's how do you get to that next stage where we start thinking about multi-scalar um, democratic planning of the economy? Mm. Okay. Um, just, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to add to to what Matt said. Um, so you know, thinking of you know this this plurifer, plurifer, uh, this. Uh, it's, uh, it's like it's all these ideas that are floating around, you know, community wealth building and so on, uh, the foundational economy uh, and, and influencing policymakers. Um, in Barcelona, for example, uh, if you look at their metropolitan planning office, uh, it went through some, you know, uh, more or less progressive changes within the context of Barcelona and Comú, and that included adopting this framework of the foundational economy uh, and also the mission oriented approach. Which is interesting because the mission-oriented approach it gets to the your concern the concerns you raise around being very kind of high-tech focused, right? And on the other hand, the foundational economy is does not have that focus. Is really it really looks at this sort of obscured, concealed, unappreciated sphere of life, which is basically how we feed ourselves, how we clothe ourselves, and and, and find shelter and so on. Um, and in that case, uh, because these ideas were sort of floating around um, and the moment was right, um, they've adopted that um, framework and you see them using this sort of mission approach for these much more sort of foundational uh, needs rather than let's, uh, you know, attract um, foreign investment, entrepreneurship and so on. It's they've sort of moved away from that discourse. 
um, which which has some which sort of converges with you know the cons again the concerns you raise around the Phillips and Rozwarski model of you know high tech algorithmic planning, uh, which um, I don't know I hope it was uh, clear in the presentation maybe it wasn't but I, I don't think Matt and I are, are going down that line, um, and I think um, we're much more aligned with sort of the a post growth uh, perspective of you know thinking of open technologies uh, rather than these you know. Um, uh, technologies that are, you know, embedded in, um, in the, the sort of the capitalist form of life. Uh, but again, as Matt said, you know, trying to work through these these mediations. Um, and, and in terms of policy, um, yeah, um, there's one example that's that's interesting in France. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Institut uh, or Institut La Boétie. Which is um, linked to Union Populaire. I guess I don't know if that party still exists, but it was like a coalition party uh, with Mélenchon and others of the left. Um, and they put out a pamphlet um, in 2021 uh, on ecological planning, um, sort of very much I think aligned with a degrowth or post-growth perspective. Uh, and they have been talking about ecological planning from I think uh, the early 2010s, uh, something like that. Uh, and of course, criticized, you know, as as uh, Soviet, uh, you know, uh, top down bureaucratic, um, you know, Stalinist or whatever. Um, but um, most recent, more recently, now even Macron has adopted this idea of well, we need something like ecological planning. So I think um, you know there are there are some cases that can be drawn on. Some do use you know the the word planning, like in in the French case. Um, but I think many others don't, um, and are, are um, you know, when thought together, well aligned with sort of what we're proposing. Um, yeah. Just, just to really I, quickly jump in um, and just say, there was building on what what you have just said around the foundational economy being these kind of mundane, everyday life things that can. Uh, there's something to this, right? I think that is a way that you can you can spin to policymakers in a kind of a political electoral sense to say, well, bring people from diverse class backgrounds, intersectional class backgrounds together around a common project. Well, what is that? The foundational economy seems to suggest it's sort of the foundational economy kind of thesis seems to suggest it could just be that like that infrastructure for everyday life. So this book like this, for instance, this book, I don't know if you can see it with the light, the spatial contract. Mm -hmm. It's called the spatial contract and it's basically sort of saying well forget the social contract let's talk about the spatial contract where we have these these kind of infrastructures for everyday life these collective reliance systems like water water pipes utility cables you know food supply chains supermarket catchment areas can we generate a new politics around these things where people are kind of animated and mobilized to care about them because they're and they're angry in the uk right now people are angry that Thames Water Company, a privatised water company, pays their chief executive four million pounds a year and they pump sewage into the rivers and the sea. People were angry about that across across the class divides, across the traditional political party um, divides. And I wonder whether there's something to that tapping into this sort of and I guess it taps into that metabolic idea of like economies being. I don't know how we do it. I don't know how people start to rethink the imaginaries of the economy around this way, in this way. And I think the foundational economy is just one imaginary to do that. But like, I think that's there's some there's some kind of there's some potential in that. I think. But anyway, I'll um I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, Javier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. As you were speaking and having this um, conversation with Mario, I, I was thinking about. A question, which is, um, do you think that democratic uh, economic planning can fully escape the efficiency trap? And let me elaborate a little bit of what I mean here. Um, as we have to, like, you know, we recognize that we have challenges, very, very much pressing challenges ahead. At the same time, like, we want to sort of coordinate federations or federations into confederations or whatever. There is a possibility that efficiency and a sort of democratic efficiency notions will have to be in place. Is that a possibility? And if that happens, how can we prevent the institutions, the structures that we establish to enable a democratic economic planning taking a life on their own? And uh, eventually becoming like the Max Weberian kind of like 
the Bavarian Iron Cage, the sort of like bureaucracy where like, you know, follows its own rules and procedures, regardless of how people or the, the, the participation, the participation um, of the people is uh, sort of like initially, initially, initially conceived. So my point is that, is this a really like a dichotomy between efficiency and democracy? And if not, how do we make these trade-offs in a democratic way? <laughs> so I think, for example, if you look at um, Paul Adler's uh, article on planning, um, which came out in organization theory, um, he specifically argues that like uh, planning would be more efficient. If I remember correctly, I think he he sort of you know makes this argument and um, um, I, I can't say that I've, I've thought enough about this to give you a, a good answer. Um, efficiency is not, you know, something I'm primarily concerned with um, expanding, let's say. Um, how I see planning is that um, we should think of it more in terms of is it effective at, at, at uh, rather than efficient at um, meeting the objectives that we want to meet, primarily our, the climate targets. Um, so I think more in terms of effectiveness than efficiency. Um, and um, I think part of that would be, well, of course, uh, for it to be democratic, you have to build into any planning system um, a form of counter power um, um, that is embedded in, in sort of trade unions, associational civil society and so on. Um, and also work towards, you know, new, new indicators um, to measure how effective we are in meeting our objectives. Um, that's not easy and um, I'm not, uh, it's not sort of my, uh, I'm not a specialist in this area, uh, but things like multi-criteria sort of evaluation and so on, which don't reduce the kind of decisions that we make and how we measure them to sort of like reductive efficiency measures. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there that's something to, to explore, I guess. Um, and I don't have a, 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 a worked out answer to that, um, but I, I share your your sure concern and and uh, yeah, it's a good good question. Okay, do we have any other questions? No, maybe a final remark about uh, what Matthew was saying about the daily daily life. I think that's we had many discussion with Javier about that, and we. Even if marginally, we try to address this point in our last uh, paper in uh, ecological economics when we uh, we explored uh, well, the the evolution of the internet cables, submarine cables, and the possibility to to descale or to degrowth such a planetary infrastructure. And this is like a, really like has to do with our daily life because everybody is using internet for everything now, no. So, and how this is affecting, uh, well, the, 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 how this is definitely affecting our life, but how this will also affect the way we perceive a potential descaling of, uh, of our activities, no? And if, to what extent this is possible? To, to, to what extent this, uh, this infrastructure can, can be descaled, mm -hmm. no? And this also needs to be planned because one of the idea of uh, of the growth is, is a control democratic uh, uh, plan, the scaling of the economy, and this also has to do with infrastructure. So, for example, water pipelines and uh, electric grids and all this stuff. You now, how we do, how we deal with that? You know? And nuclear power. Nuclear power. This is another topic to that we this is still open, and we we are debating and we are reflecting about the fact that. If we want to have a post-growth society without nuclear power, we need to plan how to manage the, the nuclear plants that are, they are there. Mm -hmm. And they will be there for probably centuries, right? And this is a fundamental planning uh, project. Apart from the, from the fact that the nuclear power production is totally planned, it's something that is it's not uh, let the... Uh, is not given to the free market uh, mechanism. It's totally planned and controlled, actually. It's, it's very highly controlled. 
Okay, so I think that we have a lot of uh, food for our brain, and uh, I very happy that you are joining us in the conference. Uh, to the conference, you are joining the conference, presenting your work in Pontevedra in June, and we are totally open to any kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, any ideas that you have? Also, if you want to visit us, so we have a program for visiting people here. We are always hosting people. PhD students, postdoc, uh, food professor. So we, you are totally welcome to to join and visit us for a couple of days or a couple of months. And so this video will be uh, uploaded in our YouTube channel, and we will disseminate and advertise on our social media. And thank you very much for for your presentation, and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the week. Yeah. Um, you know, thank. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, it was really nice to come and present this to you and, and to get some challenging questions for us to, to think about uh, in this kind of ongoing project. Um, so uh, yeah, 